Hey guys. So I wanted you to see this, this newspaper I found from uh, the mid 400s in Rome talking about the potential sack of the entire empire from these, uh, these uh, marauding Hungarian based warlords called the Huns led by the infamous Attila the Hun now apparently because he's posing such a threat to the empire we're actually going to be teaming up with our mortal enemies I think the Visigoths one of those northern That's just a sign of my lack of understanding because I guess we've been relying on barbarian um, mercenaries for years, for centuries really, to maintain our empire's borders all the way in England and over out east in Persia, Israel. Palestine, North Africa, and Carthage. But nonetheless, Attila's kind of a scary dude. He's just going, and I think he's been quoted as saying, Yeah, here it is. He says, There where I have passed, the grass. That's scary. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, guys. Um, this is just a local election paper. A little pamphlet on a newspaper. Really thin, crim crispy, crinkly. Makes some really good sounds. So, um, for those of you who are new to the channel, this might just seem like a weird, really awkwardly acted out intro, but to those of you who are veterans, this is, on top of that, also uh, a standard staple of uh, the channel. Generally, just like to find something nice to tap on and pretend I'm reading out of. Um, but in all seriousness, today, uh, I, wanna, I wanted to thank Sebastian Williams, man. Thank you for supporting the channel and um, requesting this really cool topic you gave me the uh, the reins to pick an ancient military campaign so I picked this with Attila it's called the battle on the Catalonian plains over in France I think yeah in Gaul that's where it is so Let's find out what Attila did, how he, in a weird way, really set the fall of the Roman Empire on a interesting trajectory by being such a force to be reckoned with that he caused Rome to actually ally with these seemingly hostile Germanic tribes. It was the only way. It was like, um, it was like Thor teaming up with Loki to defeat, uh, Thanos. Thanos, Thanos, Thanos. Um, anyways, yeah, it's an interesting story, so let's find out more about Attila, and, uh, let's get right into it. So, from 
my understanding of history, it's very limited, no doubt wrong in many places, but currently the way I understand the fall of the Roman Empire is that they were brilliant political, military, and governing. Um, they were brilliant at these running the state and developing states and running armies and military tactics campaigns they were a little less brilliant with philosophy and art they kind of mainly copied from the Greeks they were more practical minded less abstract and because of their brilliance they were able to absorb so so many cultures, and apparently every time they, um, you know, through military campaigns, and every time they would attack, conquer, and assimilate other tribes all the way out west in the Gaelic, Scandinavian, Norse lands, northwest, east in Persia, Middle East and India even, they would assimilate their gods, those local gods, into the big pantheon. I like that sound, and apparently you guys do too, so I want to try to incorporate that. The big pantheon of, of current, what's the word, extant, existing Roman gods. Um, and what that did was by not having a, a rigid religious structure, they were able to incorporate the cultures and the identities of the entire groups of people into the huge, you know, s mechanistic assembly of gears they called the Roman Empire. And where I'm getting at with all this is that I think Rome got too bloated. It tried to assimilate too many gods, too many cultures, too many different peoples and perspectives to the point where it lost the structure and integrity of its own founding set of axiomatic beliefs, religious beliefs, people became disillusioned with which gods were important, which priests to believe, and as a result it collapsed internally, morals started being abandoned, and it became weak and susceptible to more mon- not monotheistic, but more, more unified, more unified tribes, such as some of the more, um, the, the northern Germans. And this eventually led to the fall of the Roman Empire. And of course, over hundreds of years, they were being slowly absorbing more and more German, Germanic, German peoples. And these peoples, in turn, um, just like any great immigration of peoples, after a couple of generations, they become citizens, right? And when you're a citizen, generally you can, I mean, you don't even have to be a citizen sometimes. You can join the military. And once your military starts being composed of more outsiders than it is insiders, it's kind of a inevitability for the uh, internal structure to um, collapse. Attila came right at a very... Yeah, why does all this matter? It's because Attila 
I think, was uh, important, it appears. He was an important figure and cause of the collapse of the Roman Empire. It seems like he weakened them and struck a, a fatal blow to them. He expanded the Hunnic Empire to present-day Germany, Russia, Ukraine, in the Balkans, the area north of Greece. He also invaded Gaul, which is modern-day France, with the intention of conquering it, though he was defeated in the great battle of the Catalonian Plains. So let's, let's figure out what that is. And so much of a let's let's get a little background and we're gonna arrive at the Battle of the Catalonian Plains and we're gonna see how that ties into the fall of the Roman Empire and the rise of Germanic kingdoms. Um much of Attila's infamy comes from his relentless campaigns westward into Europe. He pillaged the riches of the Roman Empire and uh, for a while actually got, I think, some like 750 pounds of gold every year that he uh, So Attila was not just a blip, a blip on the map, he was around for decades. And he was the, sort of like the culmination of the Hunnic Empire. For, I think, maybe up until about a hundred years before Attila, the Romans didn't even know who the Huns were. They weren't really a force to be feared. But slowly but surely, um, you know, as the tides of history ebb and flow, empires grow and get bloated and get weak from the inside due to lack of pressure and stress and um, an urge to be strong, and they crumble because more hungry, literally, people, hungry people, and people from hungry sometimes, are much more assertive, much more wrapped with the desire to conquer and find a better place for themselves in life and geographically. Yeah, Rome was... Historians believe Rome's true weakness was brought on by centuries of imperial mismanagement and overextension. So the collapse of Rome was considered 476 BC. And a hundred years before that, let's start there. So th roughly 395, maybe 80 years before, Emperor Theodosius, Theo Theodosius the first dies. The Roman Empire at that point, 395, AD is divided into two parts, two parts. The Eastern Empire, governed by his son Arcadius in, I think, Byzantium, Constantinople. Modern-day Istanbul. In the Western Empire, by his son Honorius, Honorius. 
now. Fifty years later, the barbarian peoples, the Swabians, the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Franks, and the Burgundians, they cross the border. Cross the border. they put themselves in the service of Rome. They were kind of their own units, their own tribal political entities, but sometimes Rome needed external help, and they would commission these, um, keep forgetting the word, mercenaries. So it was kind of like on a contract basis at first, but then it became more of a consistent um, thing for the Germans to be part of the military of Rome. And now right around the same time these Germans are slowly working their way down across the Danube and the Rhine rivers, the main rivers dividing Europe in the east, uh, north and south, kind of. You could think of it like that. Attila, the king of the Huns, from 445, invades Gaul. At the head of a German, a Roman Germanic coalition, Aetius defeats Attila at the Battle of Catalonian Plains, after which Attila retreats with his loot. The Huns sack northern Italy a year later, but leave the Italian peninsula without attacking Rome itself. The following year, Attila dies, and after his death, the Hunnic Empire quickly disintegrates. And then, about 20 years later, Odoacer, the German word um, oh, sorry, a German warrior, possibly of Siri origins. He becomes the king of Italy, deposing the emperor Romulus on September the 4th. And from that day, the Western Roman Empire ceases to exist. And um, because, you know, a hundred years before that, it was divided into the Roman Empire and Istanbul or Constantinople actually maintained its jurisdiction, its its uh, political unity, existence really until fourteen the fourteen hundreds, but uh, a thousand years later. But the Western Roman Empire centered in Rome actually fell in uh, four seventy six. And I think a really interesting fact was that Odoacer, the German warrior king, he deposed, he didn't kill, but deposed this last Roman Empire emperor called Romulus, which is fitting because the first Roman king, the founder of the Roman Empire, the Roman of Rome itself, was named Romulus. So that's a brief overview, and let's see where, how Rome got to the point of being so weak, its emperor could be easily disposed of. Relations between the later Roman Empire and the barbarian tribes that massed on its northern border have commonly been portrayed as straightforward mutual hostility. But in reality, the complex relationship between Rome and its neighbors grew more interconnected through the third and fourth centuries. I hope 
healthy, healthy Roman respect for Germanic tribes dates back at least to the time of Christ or Julius Caesar. Zero, you know, at zero AD. Um, border skirmishes continued throughout the early empire. But the barbarian threat started to erode imperial authority itself during a series of disastrous reigns in the 3rd century. During this time, um, severe economic crises weakened the central Roman rule, strapped for cash, Successive emperors debased the currency. Not unlike what we're doing today, just printing, printing more money. Except back then they couldn't print more metal. They took the metal that they could and diluted it and redistributed it. Distributed it <laughs> as a, um, under the guise that it wasn't diluted. So, I, I, I believe, because I don't think they made that well known that they were diluting its value. Um, taking real gold and, or silver, and mixing weaker, less valuable metals with it. But, of course, instead of uh, short-term financial relief, So, capitalizing on the chaos, Goths and other Germanic tribes, they began attacking the Roman borders. And, of course, to have a standing military, you only have that to the extent that you can pay your militia. And with the lack of money, or at least the extreme deflation, or inflation, sorry, of the money, the currency, it's losing value, and it's not so easy to maintain a huge army, and of course Rome was built on the economic policy, um, on the military policy of expansion, and of course every time as they expanded, conquered new lands, they had the wealth, not only the wealth of those lands that they could pillage, but also the ability to tax, tax the lands in the future, and have a consistent income. Um, hmm, sort of sounds like a pyramid scheme to me, actually, when you think about it. The overall survival of the structure itself kind of depends on the expansion, the continual incorporation of new sources of revenue to, um, to be funneled up to the Pope and Emperor. loyal to a tribe, 
you're kind of a much more imposing political military force than if your military combatants are only loyal to the paycheck. And I think that's what happened to Rome right around the time of Attila. Complex power struggles ensued between the Eastern and Western empires, which both were facing external military threats in the 370s. Yeah, the Huns, they're hungry. Alright, Ken, you guys are getting sick of that joke by now, I'm sure. The Huns, in the 370s reports, I just read that. <laughs> who, uh, so the Huns, who had arrived so swiftly, seems like they came out of nowhere. Um, Yeah, and they were, they were sweeping across Europe. And Attila was apparently... What was it? He learned to shoot a bow at three. Learned to, learned to um, wield a saber at five, I think it was. Learned to, learned to ride a horse before he could walk. Pretty fascinating. These, um, these Huns, I mean, they were, they were far from sedentary. They were always on the move and they were constantly belligerent. I guess you might say. I want to make sure this uh, this article talks about how Attila was actually Hans. Attila was actually at one point held captive in a Roman territory where he learned. Okay, so I don't... Yeah, I don't see where it says that. But it does, and we'll talk about in just a few minutes how uh, Attila and this other Roman military leader, one of the highest ranking military commanders actually. So, I know there is a very weird intermingling of Roman and Hunnic relations. It wasn't just the Huns were completely outside. They were slowly, you know, they weren't invading Western Europe and then going back to their homeland. They were slowly, nomadically staking claims in the European continent and staying there. And they developed a relationship with the Roman generals that also essentially lived on the frontiers of the Roman Empire.
historians believe that the Huns are related to the John say Gyeongnu, the tribe, a tribe who lived on the steppes of Eastern Asia near modern-day Mongolia. And in the early 4th century, they began moving westward. Moving westward across the steppe. One of the earliest descriptions of them comes from the Roman historian Emanius Marcellinius, who played up some of their more uncivilized traits. He described a people who warmed up meat by heating it with their thighs in more crude clothes made of skins of field mice sewn together. pretty primal. Other Roman sources emphasized their formidable military skills as mounted horseback archers. So yeah, these guys are a force to be reckoned with. And they had a very Asiatic oriental look because oriental means east just like occidental means west. Um, and they were from the east. In 445, having inherited the mo uh, lands that stretched from modern-day Germany to the Black Sea in the east, Attila began his rule by murdering his brother Bleda. sole leadership of the Huns. In the early years of his reign, they were marked by a campaign of terror against the Eastern Roman Empire, alternating outrageous demands for vast amounts of tribute, with devastating incursions into imperial lands, um, even penetrating deep into Greece. In 447, so, so the penetration and extreme takeover of deep, deep Greece was a foreshadowing of pretty much their puncture of the Roman bubble, if you will. was not at all a part of their culture and lifestyle. So yeah, they were just slowly but surely grabbing kingdoms and cities and toppling empire, um, toppling local leaders until until he turned his attention to the Western Empire, especially Gaul, which is, of course, modern-day France. So in 
So if the Hun King were looking for an excuse to invade the Western Empire, he got one in the form of Honoria, the strong-willed sister of the Western Roman Empire. So she was um, to be his bride. Valentinian III was the brother of this woman, the Western Roman Emperor, exiled to Constantinople by her brother. Honoria tried to escape by letting it be known to Attila that he could marry her. Just take his hand. In marriage is what she wanted to do. I don't know why I went Yoda there. Sorry. Um, although the emperor foiled her plan, Attila artfully considered Honoria his wife and demanded half. the Western Roman Empire as dowry, as a wedding gift. Valentinian's flat refusal was reason enough. Here's where politics, very, very political movement right here. This is a uh, political jujitsu, or in his case, archery. He saw a target aimed at it using political arrows. So as he accepted the offer of Honoria to be his wife. Most of human history, it's expected that with the marriage of a woman, you get a dowry or a gift from her family. And as would be expected in such a large empire, the dowry should be a considerable portion of the actual And uh, when he didn't get his dowry demands met, Attila just used that as a legitimate reason to invade Gaul, the land that he was proposing to uh, annex as a dowry. Eventually he hoped the chaos he would unleash there would force Valentinium to pay him to leave. So either way, he was trying to get what he wanted. He saw Attila saw Gaul as an easy target. The local population was composed of Visigoths, which I think is another word for Western Visi, meaning Western Goths, um, and other Germanic tribes who had settled there. A complex mix that he assumed would thwart Rome's attempt to mount an effective defense. Because again, he's realizing that Rome is becoming bloated, it's becoming full of so many different, so many dispersed and disparate and not necessarily um, unified cultures, you know? Every culture has its own different beliefs and perspectives on the world, and he saw this internal opposition starting to shake Rome's foundations. And, uh, I just wanted to go get my little letter opener I got from Greece. I think you guys liked it, a couple of you liked it in um, my Illuminati video. So uh, I'll try to be gentle with it. cities of northern Gaul, one 
after the other. His expectation of weak opposition, however, had not taken into account the skillful diplomacy of the Roman general, general Flavius Aetius. Now this is the guy I want you to pay attention to if you're not already asleep. Because um, it's fascinating the, the skills that this guy cultivated. This guy Flavius Aetius, Aetius, spelled A E T I U S, T I U S, Aetius, who was able to draw all the diverse peoples of Gaul, Visigoths, Franks, the Burgundians, and the Alans. <laughs> I didn't know that was a trap. Into a strong coalition of forces to face the Hun threat. Aetius was able to do this because he had actually been held captive, was it? Held yeah, that's what it was. Sorry, I guess you guys can't. Aetius understood how the Huns thought. He was a brilliant soldier and statesman. He effectively directed Emperor Valentinian's reign after becoming supreme commander of the Western Roman Empire um, 20 years before in 430. Aetius had spent time as a hostage of the Huns. So he His experience in captivity had led him to establish valuable personal relationships with key Hun leaders, so he actually knew Attila um, fairly well. And this is so interesting, like, to an uneducated individual, this is part of history that makes it so fascinating. It's that the principles of honor yeah it always just really impressed me at how you know all the way up to I guess modern day war in some maybe respects opposing sides who are literally drawing swords to kill and killing one another can respect, can have respect for each other. So, Flavius Aetius was held hostage by the Huns. No doubt he had killed many Huns, yet he was able to develop a relationship with the leaders of the Huns. It's like during um, World War One, was it? Or are they literally opposing sides, shooting, killing each other on Christmas Day? Or I think it was a whole week played soccer matches with each other and were able to drop their weapons and hold a temporary armistice. I think that speaks powerfully and profoundly about our deepest rules and values that we have. So nonetheless, Aetius understands Huns, and he is the, literally the head Roman military commander of the West.
So yeah, and the only way Aisha's even rose to power was by employing Hunnic mercenaries in the service of the Empire. With their help, he had launched a series of military campaigns aimed at keeping the majority of the barbarians settled in Gaul under control. And uh, despite his abilities of a military leader like this, nothing better illustrates just how much power the Western Roman Empire had lost than the need to cobble together such an alliance at all. Um, at this point, in the mid-400s, Rome is literally relying on one tribe of barbarians. You know, to them, everybody was a barbarian who wasn't Roman. To fight and hold at bay another. And they would switch sides, which is the crazy part. Estimates suggest that 50 years before, the number of Roman soldiers in Gaul had exceeded 50,000. But 50 years later, of civil uh, skirmishes and neglect, it depleted its ranks to only a few thousand. Wow. So the Huns wreaked their usual devastation on Gaul after Attila was denied the hand of Honoria in the east and he came to uh, claim his dowry. But the solid opposition that he met increasingly frustrated Attila's aim of smash and grab. Smash and grab. That was his technique. To just raid and pillage and kill I wouldn't say indiscriminately, um, he certainly killed a lot of priests, but I guess if you're trying to destabilize a culture, you go for the, you know, you cut off the head of the snake and the rest will crumble. So the unexpected appearance of Aegeus and his allies obliged Attila to lift his siege on Aurelinium. Aurel and Arlenum, which is modern-day Orleans in France, in withdrawal. And after a week on the defensive, Attila decided to face down the Roman-led army on the Catalonian plains. And now we're back to the beginning. the north of the French city. So the Catalanian plains are to the north of the French city now known as Troyes, which he considered a suitable location for deploying his numerous horse-backed militia, militia cavalry. Cavalry to uh, non-ignorance, like, unlike myself. So according to the 6th century historians, sought to control a section of the high ground beside the battlefield. Aetius' army was probably deployed between this ridge and an area of thick forest, and these natural obstacles would have impeded the Huns from using one of the strategies favored by them, which is overwhelming their opponents along their flanks. using cavalry attacks. Now Attila was forced to launch a full frontal assault. On his orders, the Hun cavalry clashed with the pro-Roman alliance in the center of the battlefield. Right in the center. And the 
Visigoths counterattacked and beat back the Huns, forcing Attila to withdraw. And I actually read somewhere that they fought during the day, and usually, generally, they didn't keep going 24-7. So, as they fought throughout the entire day, and then went away to their separate camps. That night, or early the next morning, when uh, some of the Roman generals asked some reconnaissance men to uh, give them an update on where Attila was camped, they went away and came back. with the news that Attila had abandoned camp in the middle of the night. Um, so technically he lost, but also technically he was still very much alive. So despite taking away with him considerable plunder he had accumulated um, from Gaul, it was Attila's only major battleground defeat. A year later, he invaded northern Italy, sacking the cities of Milan and Aquilia. But he was talked out of launching an attack on Rome, an attack on Rome, after some hasty diplomacy by Pope Leo I. That's pretty good diplomacy. And just a year later after that, the fierce Amman leader died, somewhat anticlimactically, of a brain hemorrhage on his wedding night, and he was buried, if this story is to believe, in his elaborate triple coffin, first in gold, encased in a silver one, encased again in an iron coffin. It is said that, in a posthumous act of cruelty, the slaves who dug his graves were actually executed. And so we don't actually know where he was buried. And I actually heard that um, one of the German rulers around that time was buried in a similar way in that they, uh, they actually took a small river, like a small riverlet or stream, dammed it off, and rerouted its course, and buried the king, the German king, I forget who it was, and then undid the dam and let the river go. So the king was buried at the bottom of the river, and uh, the people who dug the grave came back and updated the local leaders of their completion, and then they were promptly killed, so that the leaders themselves did not know whether uh, where the grave was. Um, I, I probably have that wrong, but it was that's the general gist, and it's interesting. It's kind of the mystery of it, you know. It's uh, very mysterious, and it would be fascinating. Deprived of his, of his ruthless, magnetic leadership, his heirs were unable to keep the Huns together as an empire. The Hun terror dissipated as quickly as it had arrived, and historians debated its legacy ever since, questioning the extent to which the century of Hun mayhem was instrumental in Rome's eventual collapse. So, um, yeah, many modern historians consider Attila as a colorful detail in a general picture of administrative chaos in which Roman rule was threatened by more, um, or rather 
more by its own follies than any any outside enemy. Years of infighting and poor governance had left the Imperial Army under-resourced. In the fate of the hero of Gaul, the shrewd General Aetius exemplifies such folly. In 454, just two years after Attila died, or one year, sorry, he was murdered by his master, the same emperor that denied Attila the hand of his sister in marriage. Emperor Valentinian III in a fit of rage. Following Valentinian's reign, reign a series of uh, short-lived obscure emperors struggled to prevent their venerable state. Inherited from Augustus from imploding, and in 476, the last of these abdicated to a German mercenary Odoacer. In the Western Empire, was no more. And that was um, apparently it was like a 16-year-old emperor named Romulus. And um, Odoacer was just merci merciful enough to uh, not kill him, but just push him aside and say, be an um, um, emperor now. And uh, although Odoacer retained the title Emperor of Rome, he was clearly not a Roman on the throne any longer. So. History of Rome at that point was entirely left up to or the future, the fate of Rome was entirely left up to a foreigner, a non-Roman individual. So, that is considered the fall of Rome. Um, Sebastian, I hope this was Yes. Sorry if it wasn't formally about a military campaign, but I'm always so... I have a proclivity to try to take the big picture. And to me, I love piecing together the Huns and the Germans, you know, the, the Goths, Gauls, Visigoths the Romans. In understanding how they all worked, and in this weird dynamic political interplay of territoriality and cultural 